we build this thing called our code, and we are hiring. <laughs> so, I was asked to do this presentation and tell you about how we have been growing our Avocode application on top of Electron for the last, I think, five years. We have now around 20,000 users, so it proves that Electron works and it's good for your application and for your business. So, do you, do you know what Avocode is? Are you familiar with it? Yes or no? Do something yes. Yes. No. yes, you do know. Okay. Alexei doesn't know. So, <laughs> for Alexei. <laughs> so Alco is, a, is an application which helps developers to somehow convert design to their code. So I have a design here, which is a sketch file. I can click on the button here and I get some styles. You know, I can export the button in SVG, JPEG, SVG, whatever that be. So we are trying to help developers to achieve their goals. So, so that you know what we are up to and what's the scale of, the, of our goals. Okay, so let's go right to it. I made a list of five topping issues that we have when we were building our goals with Electron. And let's start from the beginning, which is number five, of course, logically. And this is that as web developers, we were pretty unaware of all those things that we encountered on a desktop because I would start as, as a fork of Atom Editor which was straight up fork so a former Apple team they just took Atom and they tried to you know do something about it to make it work as the application you've seen so we are all web developers logically we wrapped Atom and then Electron in order to build our code and you know this is very difficult for us because you know when you are on the web you just have your browser and that's it you know you just don't expect that there are so many possible configuration of any possible hardware that your user can have so it makes you your debugging pretty pretty difficult because you cannot ever possibly you know, simulate your application on all those graphic cards RAM configurations like 2 gigabytes up to 48 gigabytes or whatever. You don't have all the distributions available on the market. It's, it's not impossible logically. And also you don't have the, all the machines. So this makes the development pretty difficult logically. But you know you have to do it like there's no way around it. Actually Electron does a pretty good job at helping us with that because you know Electron team I suppose they try to optimize the electron running on all those uh, platforms for us, at least. The second thing is that on the web there is just one input, or maybe two. There are the files that your user may upload and the address bar, and that's it. But on desktop there are a lot of things that can you know, make your application running from some kind of context. So for example, in our code we have plugins that run in uh, for example, Photoshop and Sketch and XD, and they try to communicate with our application. There is no universal way how to do it for every single platform, I think. So, you have these many inputs that your application can have. This is, for example, I wrote here the typical protocol themes, which are pretty handy, I think. This is the easiest way to interact with the, with the operating system. But also, there might be, for example, some demons running in there, there might be some kind of sockets. Also, the, if you, for example, <coughs> drag and drop a file on top of the icon, it's not the same thing as you drag and drop the file to the browser, you know, it's, it's a different story there. You have, for example, uh, the path to the uh, file on the surface file system, but on the web there is something different, there is this object, this is a representation of the file, so you have to take care of uh, you know, there are like, I think five or six ways of how to get interact with fast, for example. And the other thing is that this kind of schizophrenia going on because you have to always try to switch the context between the web application, which is the render process of the electron, and the main process. For you who don't know, for, for you who don't know it, uh, it's because 
Electron has this MIME process, which is the process which uh, talks with the operating system. And the MIME process of, of Electron runs the render process, and the process uh, which renders the application as a real web window. So, if you want, for example, to open a new window in, El in uh, Electron, you have to communicate with the MIME process somehow. There are several ways to do it, but if you want to do something a bit more complicated, you use IPC for that. So, for example, opening this new window, which shows the design on top of your web page that you might call, um, it happens via IPC calls to my process and back to the window of the, of the design here. So, many struggles around here, surely. Again, for example, if you have your location, you don't do any installation at all, just, just open the web page and that's it, you, know, you have to install it, I think, unless you, for example, have some kind of progressive web application. But, we have to do the installation procedure too when we are building desktop application, of course. And you know, it's it's not uh, that we have to do it manually, but still we have to think about it because there are some special calls that, for example, on Windows, when you're installing the uh, icon and stuff like this, it is a special way to do it in Electron. And of course, for example, passing command line arguments, you also have to pass them from the main process to the render process. And fourth thing is, you know, for the user-facing side, the shortcuts. Um, actually, I didn't realize that because most of the time I use some web applications, but it is true that I'm used to use shortcuts when I'm uh, on my uh, my machine running, for example, my IDE. I'm using shortcuts all the time. And actually, what I wanted to do was that our code should feel like a real desktop application, so we decided that it must be a great support for the shortcuts. The problem with web is that there's not a great support for that from the browser. We have this global scope where all those uh, shortcuts are running. Sure, you can scope them for some elements, but it doesn't work in practice pretty well. So we have to come up with a custom solution based on React.js, and you still have problems with the shortcut scope. But you know, we can live with that for now. Number four, uh, I want to talk about the electronegative APIs, which are Awesome, you can do anything with Electron, it's great. But the problem is, uh, those APIs tend to be very, very simple, which is good, surely is good, but you have to uh, work way through them in order to build some kind of abstraction around them. An example of that are the menus. So, for example, uh, we, uh, you know, for in every, every application on a desktop, you have this menu here, which is the system menu, I suppose, I don't know how they call it. This menu here, and for example, you also have a menu here. Can you see it? The light is called icon. And you can control these menus from the electron. They are combinated, and there's no web around it. But you have to use the native electron APIs for that, which is cool. You can do it, surely. But the problem is that these APIs tend to be imperative and simple. So, uh, what our former team at Elco do was that they use the method called get application menu and they look through all those items in the menu and manually change the text for example to something else which was, you know, it didn't work quite well there were bugs all the time so we had to come up with our solution and as you can see here, this is the actually real code which is by the way wrong because uh, I had to make it that much smaller in order to fit it on the screen but this code really runs in our application and this code actually describes how the menu should look like. So this code here is a tools menu here, right? It's a real code. So in order for us to make it work as we are used to, uh, we had to implement it in a different way in a reactive API and we like React.js so that we could use it everywhere and we wanted to make the, the API uh, so similar to Relic that we wouldn't even think about it. So, as you can see here, we made this menu component component, which is not React, which is our own implementation, and we just hang the listener to it. You have the, the store here, and you listen for a changes in the store, and if the store changes, you set a new state of the, this menu to menu component. It works similar to React. The only difference is that we don't return in some kind of JSX component or HTML, we return an array, and this array, which is being returned here, I have to comment it out because it did not put the screen. But this is this 
thing here. This is the, the, the array that's being returned. And we are filling up these, uh, these little variables so that uh, the tools are enabled and disabled when we need them. So, the only task is to register this component somewhere, watch for its changes, and then if this component changes, we just create this new template and set it again. So we build this reactive API around all those one of those menus that you see. So, this menu runs like this, context menu runs like this too, and I'm not sure, but I think this menu also runs as our custom reactive menu. So, let's go to number three, which is auto updates. I think auto updates deserves speak on their own because there are a lot to cover. And I also wrote an article about how to make those Windows Auto bit workings on on uh, on Electron. Actually, I think this is our most read topic in our blog ever on our code. I'm not sure, maybe. <laughs> but the problems with the uh, with the updates, there are a lot of problems with them. But you know, the fundamental problem is that they are not universal. So you can do auto updates, as far as I'm concerned, on only two platforms, which is Mac and Windows. Mac works okay, all you need to have is a summary API in your backend which returns an URL to the zip file, and that's it. Uh, because, you know, the Apple application is just the application.app file, and you just download it and replace the old one with the new one, that's it. With Windows, it's a different story though. I think that it makes some sense to you know, tell you all about it now. I already know that is that you need a summer server, a squirrel installer, and new big new NUPGKGS files, <laughs> which at least there's always three of them, I'm going four of them, generated on every, on every update, and you have to put them to the server, and you have to also have this releases file, which stores information about this new good files, whatever, and then it might work. It doesn't work most of the time, we try to do it for the first time, but at the end we will be probably able to do it. I think it is not that bad actually. If you get your head around it, you can get rid of it. But maybe Alexei will know more about it. <laughs> no, he does not. Okay. Uh, the, the problem here is that there are so many things that can break, so it will break eventually at some point. Uh, I must say that as of now we didn't have many troubles with our updates for the last, I don't know, maybe a few days, <laughs> <laughs> maybe even weeks, I don't know, but you know, it works pretty well right now, I think it even works better than, oh no, it, it works well, let's see you like this. <laughs> On Linux there are no other updates, uh, as you know, uh, Linux have these distribution zip files and you, they are just being placed somewhere and you know, out of the terminal, you can run them. Uh, I think there's some kind of new thing called Snap, which is made by Canonical, and it looks promising, but we have not implemented it yet. But we will we'll definitely look into it. If you have some repository on apt-get, you can surely use some kind of auto base from the terminal, but you know, a user has to do it on his own, so you have to tell him that, ooh, there's new auto you have to run this command in order to make it work. So, that's a, of course a natural problem with all of these. The second problem is again the debugging. So, if you, for example, if there is a new Electron version available and you update your code base with new Electron, it's awesome, if you have grants, you are really happy. This is very likely it will break the auto updates. So, in order for you to properly test the auto updates, you have to build a new version of your application, you have to upload it to the server, you have to ask people to try them on some kind of strategic environment. So if you update from the current production version to the new update, it works okay, you are glad, it's great. But you also have to check that update works from the next update to another update. So what you have to do is that you make two builds and you are trying this all over again in order to be sure that it works. Funny thing that happened to us, I think half a year ago, was that uh, one, of our, uh, one of our bosses Updated to Moha Mojave, or I don't know, it's price station, whatever. <laughs> they updated to product Mojave and auto update on uh, Mac stopped working completely. 
it's a devil's it can't do it because there's some security problem. It turns out that we do not use uh, SSL for our checking uh, whether there is an update or not. We didn't know that actually this runs like in a in a native environment, so it didn't work, it crashed completely. I think uh, when this update arrived, around 50 people, maybe more, 150 people downloaded it already on Mac. So we stopped the update, and some of those people who already downloaded it, they couldn't update again. So this was a problem, surely. <coughs> so we had to do some kind of rollbacks and way around it, we had to send emails to those users, you know. It was very, very painful. Funny thing about uh, Windows is that Electron works well. If you install, you know, Electron application, it also installs the installation program, so it's great. It works. But the funny thing problem was that if some user downloaded our output like a few years ago, they had this installation program pretty old, and this installation program, I think, should not or is not do is not updated again. So Electron does not overwrite it again. So, for example, if uh, the Electron team somehow changed the API, as they did, they broke our updates. So again, our most you know, faithful users, or the users that had our code for like a few years, they couldn't update. And it wasn't our fault, you know, so it's like, oh, yeah, this pity. So I had to wrote a special application inside our, our code in order to update this update is a file which you know, updates the application. So it's terrible, you know. And you know, the, the, the biggest problem with desktop application is that when the auto update doesn't work, your application is not being delivered because, you know, if you're on a web, you just upload your files to server and it works. You know, other people have the version immediately. But on desktop, well, you know, people are stuck at the version that which worked for them for the last time, and which means that if there's a problem, you may not know about it because people just don't report it because they are okay, you know, because just Apple doesn't update. It's like Java updates, you know, no, no, no one does. So that's a problem, you know. <laughs> like even will tell you that it doesn't work. So we can see in our mix panel that there are a few people that having which they have like pretty old version of a code, but you know, we just we can send them email, we can show them some model, but if they won't update, they just won't do it. You know, during time in the future Google will just stop working for them because you know something will break on our backends. And that's how it is. They will just send us few furious messages. To our software team, and they will then tell them no, which application. But that's how it is, you know. This is the living with the desktop applications. Number two, um, Apple Code runs on a desktop, like here. So this is a application, electron application, and it also runs as a web application. So I have it right here. <laughs> I have this Apple Code running here. It's just like normal web page, you know. Uh, logically, you know, we, we first we built our code as a desktop application, and on a desktop you just don't care about the size of the application that much. Yeah. And if you build a web application, you should care about the size of your application, because, you know, if it's too big, it's just too big. So our code's got 2.3 megabytes right at the moment. I know what you are saying to yourself that this is pretty much, but you know, I can tell you that, for example, STRV page here <laughs> <laughs> has got 1.2 megabytes, which is less than our code, surely, but not that, not that much. <coughs> for example, AirBank, you know, they are just 1.3, which is more than STRV, but less than our code. It is, you know, it is, it is not even, you know, 100% more, our code is just 2.3 megabytes. I should also say that our code is even bigger because we have special rendering rendering machine which renders the designs and which got, I think, 4 megabytes GZ, so it's pretty large anyway, but still, this thing here does many things, even without the you know, rendering of the design. I think it does a bit more than you know a landing page of Airbank or maybe even a landing page of STRV, but it doesn't matter. So, it's a challenge to have you know, your application as, as small as possible. 
and we are working on it because it, you know, it concerns uh, the performance pretty much. So, what I want to say, by the way. So, uh, we have this desktop application and we want it to be able to run it on the web too. So, how do we do it? Uh, if you start you know, writing an electron application, the problem is that you have this temptation to write Node.js code inside of a uh, web browser, which is okay. Electron can do it for you. It supports doing the require in the browser, which is just, you know, it's cool, you know, you can do anything. You have this web page and you can do node stuff there. You know, it's awesome, you can build anything there. But, you know, it, this won't work on the web, logically. There is no require on the web, or there is require on the web, but it doesn't do what you expect it to do. And, you know, if you have FS on the web, it just won't work the way you expect it to work, because you can access the, the file system from the web application, right? Logically. So, we are trying to figure out a way how to do it. So, the first idea to have is to use dependency injection. And it should solve any problem in the world, right? Like world hunger, poverty, and everything. Dependency injection, as David Guru says, can do it for you all. But you know, you can surely do it. You can just pass some kind of implementation of file system to your code, and you know, it will do something. It will be, you'll be able to, to you know, compile an application and run it on the web somewhere. You'll be able to do it. But the problem is, the, the fundamental problem is that you're on a different platform. So doing fs.existing just makes no sense because the file won't ever exist there, right? So you have to do something else. So DI, sure, but there's a you know, problem what you build service. So, for some cases, it will surely work. So you can do a polyfill for a web file system. This is actually a real web file system that we have uh, in our web implementation. And use it, for example, to write a file. So, for example, if you export an image from our code, uh, it will do a write file to your file system, surely. It won't work on the web, but if you implement write file like this, it will just go on the file for you. It's cool, like, it works. We use it every day. But for some kind of other cases, which are more complicated, it just won't work. It won't break. I have this example of how we uh, download the images uh, to your local disk. So, in our code, we have this project manager. We've got you know nice images of our designs, our Wuchek designs here, for example. And you want these images to be on your local machine, right? Because if you go offline, you don't want them to disappear, logically. So we have to have some kind of mechanism of how we say of that this, these images need to be downloaded, right? So we came up with a solution for that. And the root of that is this asset store. So all we need to do is that we have to say that, okay, this image is downloaded on the disk, you can use it uh, from your disk. You don't, have, you don't have to use it as a web URL. So this store, you just send this image ID. So every, every image has some kind of ID. You send this image ID to, the, to this method. And it will look at the images that we know that are stored on the disk. And if they are stored, we will return the local path to them. And if they are not, you will just return this uh, web URL. You know, it returns file protocol of all those uh, which is the download and the web URL if they are not. It's simple. So the question is, how can we do it in a universal way so that it can run on the web and on desktop too? So that's the real question. Is it universal or not? Well, you know, it is universal and it is universal because we don't care how information are stored. We care how we actually do things, how we do the side effects. This is the place where we need to think about how to make your application, you know, universal or isomorphic. So, uh, what's the real problem here? The real problem is actually the trying to download the image and then storing it to the disk. That's the real issue. So, we have this image component, wrap component, which does the following. If you, if you uh, come to this uh, project manager, this image will be rendered. So this is the image component. It's rendered, 
and if it sees that uh, if it sees that this uh, URL that it gets is a web URL, it will and once it is downloaded, it will receive a local path to the stage. Easy thing. So all we need to do is to make special implementation of this request download method in a downloader. And actually on the web it just won't do anything because on the web there will always be a URL to the web, not the one to local to local disk of course, logically. So how we do it? We need to uh, we need to have a way how to swap the implementations mm -hmm. so that you can use one implementation of the downloader on a desktop and another one on the web. And how we do it? Well we use IFC containers. Uh, you know, I have this sublime that says nasty things from nasty times. You know, I'm not fan of IOC containers. I think they are kind of a hackish way to do stuff, but you know, they work, so it's kind of okay. We use IOC container, which built my friend in Honza, our architecture mastermind, our lead architect of architects. And how it works? So, are you familiar with IOC containers from, I don't know, Symfony, Net, or some other frameworks? Yeah? You check is familiar, right? So if you're not, basically it works like you just register oil class that you have to some kind of container, and which figures out how to create some instance of the class for you. I know it's a bit more you know, complicated to understand that, surely I can tell you after my presentation about it more. But, how it works. So this is the some kind of implementation of desktop downloader, which is following. It gets the image ID, it creates a web, a web path for it, a web URL, and then local path, and they will do the downloading task with a web path, so it will just look for S3 for the, for the image, it will download the image, and will have then save it to your uh, local disk, and then if you say to the store, hey, this is downloaded, so it's downloaded locally, you can use it uh, as a local URL. Right, logical. On the web, well, you don't have to do anything because you just use the web path easily. So, the magic happens actually here. Uh, I say that we suck in validation, but it's not correct perfectly because we compile application already with different implementations, so it's a build time swapping of the implementation. So, on a desktop, we just require this, this uh, desktop uh, downloader class which is here, and on the web we just require different validation, and that's it. And these files are actually real files, and this is the entry point of our JavaScript file for the band link. Uh, this is uh, when you run, you know, yarn build our code for this application, it will use this file, it correct implementation for desktop, and if you run yarn build our code web, it will use this file. So, as a matter of fact, it will just create these implementations in you know, one bundle for every single platform, and that's it. A question here. Uh, Babel macros can help. Sorry? Babel macros. Babel macros, yeah. Actually, it's very really possible, it's, it's possible to do it. There are many things how come to every can of the implementations on the fly. Yeah. I'm not sure about Babel macros, uh, but there is an yeah, official way to do it. Uh, this is called browser field in package.json, which can do the trick for you too. But we already use this injector and it was pretty easy to do. Like you just change the lines here and we just implement it other ways. And it, it is cool, it just works. Uh, there's a bit overhead to it and you should definitely type your code and write uh, interference uh, interfaces for your classes. It will definitely help for you in, a, in your development. Okay, so it, this is clear somehow. Probably not, it doesn't matter. Just ask me after the presentation. <laughs> but it's cool, it was brilliant, I think. So number one, it was number one. I was uh, thinking about it, what I should put as number one. But at the end, it was like, easy choice. And there's this our code, surely. It is not electronic code, it's our code, always. Because, you know, Python runs under all of this, and you will show medium when you develop an application. But you know, Oracle is always the biggest problem. For example, you used to use CoffeeScript, which is great. You know, six years ago it was cool. Now it's not that cool because you cannot check it 
you can't type it. You, you just you just fear to you know change it anyhow. So it's not a great idea to use copy script anymore, especially when you when we have you know code base which is completely JavaScript and it's tight and it's nice and awesome. I use Babel, of course. There are many other things that Jules just pays us, for example, upload, which is always always some problems with upload. And syncing with the servers, always problem. Performance is an issue. Is again, you know, it really, it really, you know, regards somehow uh, the the electron, but the biggest problems are on our side, not the electrons. So, I think that electron is great, you know, because electron got us to twenty thousand plus customers, so you can show sure use it in your business. And it's not perfect, you know, and we are not perfect too, so. That's how it is. So thank you for attention and do you have any questions?